All right, today we have uh, the, uh, the, about the last two, uh, but certainly the, you know, our, our latest in a succession of uh, FEMSO uh, Crease Research Assistantships uh, reports on, on some of the research that's been done. I'll remind you this is a collaboration between uh, our office and the Foreign Military Studies Office, uh, represented by uh, Ray Finch here and Thomas Wilhelm. Uh, both graduates of the program, and it incorporates a st study of the area, um, a number of different research projects that involve, uh, you know, target language research, uh, and then reporting out on a blog as well as uh, producing a paper, and of course, uh, you know, this uh, report that we're doing here. So um, today we've got uh, a couple of uh, uh, students, Brian Turnbull, uh, who is going to be talking about the potential for a trafficking terror nexus in the provinces of Kazakhstan, uh, and then Deepak um, Minin, who is going to be speaking on Russia's policy towards minority republics, a case study of Tatarstan, Sahara Republic, and Gulag. And I ask them to sort of introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their research interests uh, as they start. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Brian Turnbull. I'm currently a <coughs> PhD student here at the uh, University of Kansas uh, with the Political Science Department. Uh, I did my <coughs> master's in uh, Security Studies and uh, I've always, starting then, I started an interest in Central Asia, and so I've been kind of guided by this interest in security issues in the area. And then on arriving here, I uh, picked up human trafficking, uh, and uh, it, really, it really started to become a new interest for me, and so this is where this comes from. Uh, I started out looking, uh, in the literature you see this uh, possibility for some people saying that there could be a, a nexus between uh, uh, terror groups moving into human trafficking. Uh, and so I set out to kind of look for that and focusing within Central Asia, but particularly within uh, uh So uh, you do, within literature, and you do see a potential for a trafficking terror nexus. Uh, it's the world, it's a broad consensus that it's the world's fastest growing criminal industry in human trafficking uh, compared to drugs. People are, uh, much easier to resell, and they maintain their value better than arms and drugs. If you want to think about it in that very uh, disquieting way, uh, but it's a fact. Uh, you know, profits are central to this rise. There are rough estimates the traffickers traffickers can earn around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a woman forced into sex slavery. To use that as an example, and this amounts to around uh, thirty-two billion dollars annually for traffickers. Uh, if drug markets have become saturated, uh, there's become a need to diversify into other areas of illegal activity. And so these criminal organizations have been drawn to human trafficking by the enormously high profits combined with a relatively low risk. There are low entry costs for trafficking, and smuggling allows new groups to get into the business and start making profits quickly. Risk is kept low by the fact that very few countries around the world have prioritized the prosecution of human smuggling or trafficking and the risk to benefit ratio is particularly noticeable when compared to the drug trade. Some even claim that trafficking in women has been arguably the highest profit margin and the lowest risk of almost any type of illegal activity. The amount of time, money, and effort spent by law enforcement across the globe is uh, much less on human trafficking compared to drugs. And then also within the industry, competition is a lot less lethal. The uh, market for it is growing so rapidly that you don't see uh, groups killing each other off. They can coexist because there's so much uh, potential, compared to the drug trade especially. Uh, globalization has also helped. Uh, it allows organized crime rings to establish contacts with willing collaborators and diaspora, diaspora communities across the globe. And the uh, increased level of migration also assists traffickers by providing a cover for trafficking and transporting victims. Uh, also, it's been predominantly drug organizations entering into the trafficking business uh, that you see. And they can use their transport resources that they already have in place to transport drugs and ship those over to moving humans. Um, also, uh, others have uh, argued that human trafficking has become a significant source of income for both militant, for also, also for militant networks. Pragmatically, such activities make sense. Militant political movements require resources for arms, logistics, and sustenance for the militants. Consequently, they frequently engage in criminal work to finance their activities. Human trafficking would be an attractive option. However, 
Uh, well, the involvement of criminal groups in human trafficking is well established. There's not a lot of substantial evidence that illustrates terrorist participation in the human trade. Uh, particularly within Central Asia, there are only indirect and minimal links between extreme Islamic groups, narcotic, and, arm, and arm tra arms trafficking, with little evidence at all for complicity in human trafficking. However, others do note that it is often difficult to discern between a terrorist group and organized crime. Uh, they certainly don't make it known. And uh, there's the potential for the development of future links between trafficking and terrorist groups. And so you, you don't really have this obvious evidence out there, so I kind of went in and looked for uh, the risk factors that would make uh, cooperation between terror and trafficking groups more likely. Uh, we know that criminal and terrorist elements both thrive in prisons, difficult to govern spaces, regions with endemic corruption, con conflict or post-conflict zones with little legitimate governance, border regions, free trade zones, and megacities. Fortunately, Central Asia possesses all of these, except for the cities, of course, megacities. Uh, the uh, core contributor and facilitator of criminal organizations and terrorist groups in the region is a lack of opportunity for its citizens. Lack of opportunity. Um, Yeah, I, I, if you look at like, Kazakhstan and their, and their energy sector has enabled it to do significantly better than the rest, but you still see large unemployment and individuals unable to uh, make a good living for themselves. And uh, this poor economic situation creates large numbers of unemployed or underemployed individuals who must find additional ways to support themselves and their families. Such individuals also often become willing collaborators for traffickers engaged in either the drug or the human trade. Poverty and a lack of opportunity also make desperate individuals more willing to go abroad for work, which can make them susceptible to human trafficking. A lack of resources, corruption, difficult geography, and regional measures creating free trade zones in an attempt to boost local economies has also created weak border control along several key transit points in Central Asia. However, this, so that the higher volume of trade that we now have is handled by local officials has not been accompanied by an expansion of law enforcement capabilities to discourage traffickers from exploiting the new situation. The Customs Union of the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, and Belarus is of particular importance. This agreement created a common external border across three nations that only requires one customs check at the Kazakh border before goods can be transported to the Russian or Belarusian border with the European Union. So pretty much once a trafficker gets into Kazakhstan, they face little threat of detection. So, uh, to get into this further, I, um, I wanted to look at the potential for trafficking and terror at the local level, to look at these uh, indicators at the local level. Uh, and across Central Asia, really only Kazakhstan has provided uh, reliable statistics at the local level um, by province here. Uh, I should also note that uh, while the cities of Almaty and Astana are not considered provinces, uh, they are considered on the same administrative level. Uh, and you'll also see uh, Almaty province separate from Almaty city. So, there's so, so the data from Almaty city has been extracted from? Yeah, so it's, the, the you can look at it as two different provinces, essentially. Okay. Yeah, right. as far as so, the data. It says Almaty, it, it's not 4.6 or whatever. It's, you know, they're, they're separate. Yeah, they're separate. Yeah, and it's not going to be included within the province. Yeah. That. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is uh, also, um, while Kazakh had the best statistics, they're still not great. Uh, between the variables, uh, it varies in years of, of availability. And so for poverty levels, they're really the best year they had. The most recent year they had with complete data was 2008. So you can kind of get an idea. Uh, you have the national average at the top, and then uh, by province, there for uh, poverty levels. This is the percentage. Um, so it says only one percent of the population in Kazakhstan lives below the poverty. Yeah, and so it should also be noted that this is their statistics, um, mm -hmm. and you, know, you can judge on your own how reliable they are. Yeah, which you said was most reliable in Central Asia. Yeah, there is there, yeah, yeah, shouldn't be taken more taken in context. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, up next here is uh, long-term unemployment rate, which is considered over one year. Uh, for the first quarter of 2011, also the most recent available. Um, 
up next is youth unemployment. Also for the first quarter of 2011, you'll see the uh, you know there isn't a real con continue, uh, continuation in, uh, in the highest provinces. Uh, it varies a lot. You know, and across these variables, no province, like I said, has consistently high numbers in all three indicators. Almaty City could be ranked the highest if we wanted to, regarding a lack of opportunity as the ninth highest levels of poverty, but third highest on long-term unemployment and second highest in youth unemployment. North Kazakhstan and Mangistau are uh, close behind. Another indicator here is income inequality. As of 2011, this is a Gini coefficient. Uh, measures income distribution. Lower is considered to be less, uh, is considered more income inequality. So lower is better. No, lower is worse, I'm sorry. Lower is worse. Um, North Kazakhstan and Almaty City are the only provinces that rank high on lack of opportunity indicators and also have high levels of income inequality. Uh, this slide here is crime levels per 10,000 people. Crime is a difficult indicator to use as a lack of opportunity indicators increase the likelihood of crime as well. It would become somewhat pathological. Uh, therefore, we should expect that provinces with a high lack of opportunity would also have high crime levels. Amati City is the only province with consistently high across all these indicators. This is unsurprising given that it is the largest city in the country. However, compared to the rest of the country, Kostania, North Kazakhstan, and Mangistau can also be considered to be at a higher risk of human and drug trafficking. Uh, based on these. So while there's no human tracking data set that provides information at the sub-state level, the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, uh, does maintain a database that catalogs drug seizure data by province. However, data on drug seizures for Kazakhstan is only available back to 2010 up to the present. Uh, this chart illustrates the total number of drug seizures from 2010 to 2013 by province. Uh, and terror data is even more limited. The most comprehensive database out there, uh, the ITERA data set uh, put out by Duke, only provides location data at the state level. An alternate database, the Global Terrorism Database, put out by the University of Maryland, does provide information on terror attacks by province. However, there are only 16 recorded events for Kazakhstan which really doesn't give you a large sample size to make any uh, definite conclusions from. If we look at the drug seizure data, it's interesting that Jambo province had 113 seizures over that three year period, is nearly du double that of the next uh, Karaganda, and accounts for 26% of countrywide seizures. Yet, Jambo is only the sixth most populous province, with 6% of the national population in 2010. Uh, however, the province's location on the border with Kyrgyzstan is likely a very significant factor. The customs union agreement that created a common external border, when combined with the mountainous terrain in Jambal, makes it a prime target for a trafficker trying to get into the customs union. Um, again, uh, not a lot we can draw from the, the tariff data on the right. All right, so in, in conclusion, um, we can establish the theoretical likelihood of collaboration between trafficking networks and terrorists. However, due to a lack of data, it is difficult to conduct a strong empirical test and establish any firm conclusions. Uh, a more detailed analysis could be conducted if contextual indicators were developed uh, uh, that would allow me to incorporate additional factors such as corruption, state repression, geography, and ethnic composition. Really important with that. Uh, most alarming for myself, for what I going through this and seeing what was available, uh, there's a real lack of human trafficking data out there at the sub-state level. Uh, and given the severity of trafficking, uh, if we're going to progress and conduct needed analysis that is supported empirically, we need a more detailed data set. Fortunately, we have seen some progress in measuring trafficking at the international level. And we have a much better understanding of the states that have a high trafficking risk. A good example is the Wafri Foundation's Global Slavery Index, which goes state by state. Uh, but if we are going to address this issue at the local level, more localized data is needed. Let's see. Get to the questions yeah, afterwards. I thought maybe we'd wait until after we talk. All right, folks, we'll do a joint Q&A afterwards, after uh, Deepak is able to finish his uh, presentation as well.
Hi, Tony. Uh, I am Deepak. Originally, I'm from India. I did my, like, from India, I did my undergraduate in history. I do have one MPhil degree, Master's in Philosophy, in Central Asian Studies. Right now, I'm doing my Master's in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies here. My general interest as history student, I I am interested in medieval Russian history, but uh, now I am looking more towards like the interaction between the Russian, Russian, especially the Russian Empire, than the Ottomans and others. So I am interested in both Russian case and the Turkey, not just the Turkey, Turkish of the, the modern Turkey, the the Turkic people of uh, the Asian part and the European part, the big chunk of them right now in the modern Russian Federation. As part of my project, I am working on uh, Russia's policy towards these minority republics of Russian Federation. Especially here, I am dealing with three republics, one Tatarstan, another one Chaka Republic, and the Tuva. OK, let's start. I, I like to start. <laughs> First of all, the, the, the three republics, why do I selected these three republics? These three republics, both Tatarstan, the Shaka Republic, and the Tuva. These are like somehow the autonomous republics under the Russian Federation is dominated by the Turkic groups. The, both the Tatars, Shakas, and Tuva belong to the same the Turkic family. They speak the Turkic language, but it's not exactly the same. Again, there is one difference that Tatars are situated in the modern Europe, in the part of the central, central Russia. Shaka Republic in the Russian far east, <coughs> close to the, the Kamchatka that side. Tuvas further south into close to uh, Mongolia uh, in the Russian Siberia. By the region as concerned, these three groups are different. For example, Tatars are fully Muslim. There are, I think, hardly 8 to 10 percentage Christians. Uh, they were converted under uh, the, the Ivan the Fourth. But Majority of the Tatar identity is itself is Islam. Then the Shakas is again the mixed group. The, the, they are significant number for the Russian Orthodox Church. But one interesting factor with the Shaka that the Shakas still follow the old Turkic religion. Before the when now the majority of Turks, 99% of Turks converted either into Christianity or into Islam. But Shakas still follow the, the the old Turkic religion, which is based on the like sky. Thingri. The ones, by the way, they are the only one group, Turkic group, which follow Buddhism. They follow the Mahayana form of Buddhism. It's close to the Tibetan Buddhism. Somehow they are, that they are well connected with both Mongolia and the Tibet. Then, but one important factor is urban population is predominantly Russified, then they, they are the Russian speakers. Very few of them now, especially in Tatarstan and the Shakar Republic, they try to revive the language. Now they, you know, they are part of their nationalist movement and other kinds of that. Tatarstan is here, it's on Olga, part of the remote Russia. The, right now, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, Tatars are considered as the second biggest nationality of the Soviet, sorry, the Russian Federation, just after Russian, then the Ukrainians come third. They are also considered as, from the SARS period onwards, the, the official representatives of Russian Muslims, because they were the one the Russians, the Russians are used to cons consult with, because they are the intermediary between the Russia and the, the Islamic world, both Turks and the Persian. The Kazan was an independent state. The Kazan is the capital of the modern Tatars, modern Tatar Republic. It was, uh, it was, a, like a Khanate after the disintegration of Golden Horde. Then the Kazan was a seat of one of the Khanate. This Khanate conquered by the Ivan Terrible in the fourth. You might see the well-known movie like uh, the. The Sergei Eisenstein, the Ivan, the Ivan, Ivan Ford. It's they, they, they show the Kazar, but in the, the Soviet time it was like negative picture. Thing. Then under Soviet, they established this Tatar Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. They they try their level was to become it a Union Republic, but uh, it, it, Moscow didn't permit that. 
then as everyone knows like this Lenin uh, patronized the Tatar language and culture as part of the nationality uh, policies of early Soviet Union. But later under Stalin, the red Stalin from the 1930s, I think later 1930s, 1936-37 onwards, Stalin started to promote Russians for the, uh, the survival of Soviet Union as a you know, block. So the, the, as, as, as part of that, the Tatar language got sidelined like other non-Russian languages. Then it confined to the villages of Tatarstan. But the city people, they, they feel shy to speak in Tatar, they prefer to speak in Russian. By the way, then there's a Gorbachev time, they know that the Glasnost, the Historica, the, the Tatar nationalist movement come, they do have links with the, 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 the Islamic world, wider Islamic world. Then they declared the sovereignty in 1990. But they, there, there were the uh, groups, they wanted independence like other uh, central Asia, other, other republics of uh, the Soviet Union, just like Ukraine and uh, Banaras and like, but it doesn't work. But they adopted the flag and the um, constitution, independent constitution from the Russian Federation. They do have their own flag, their own national anthem, their own constitution. Then there is one modern person like the, the Mindimesh Shaibev, it's an ethnic Tatar. He is was closely Helsin, then he is the one who is responsible for somehow uh, keep Tatarstan with Russia. At the same time, he is the one who is considered as like, he is known as father in the Tatarstan. It's, he also considered as the like the person who uh, did pretty good for the post-Soviet Tatarstan because Russia went through several economic crises, but Tatarstan didn't face much crisis, especially due to the Shaimai. The Shaimai was not willing to liberalize the, the, the its economy just like other Russian republics. Russian republic. So somehow they even the 1998 crisis the tatarstan did well pretty well because this credit normally goes to the shaimai definitely the shaimai was close to elsin but elsin needs support of the, the this regional satra so shaimai supported elsin but for that shaimai was just like a, a, a quite powerful in uh, the, the Kassan. it's not like uh, under soviet union because he was almost like a autonomous in his deeds and the, the, at the same time he, he uh, started Tatar's Tatar son established its own uh, diplomatic not exactly the, the embassy kind but the more the marketing uh, the, it's more related with economy, economy then they have their own houses in all, I think almost all three years country plus Poland uh, but it was, you know, unthinkable during Soviet Union because even the Ilsin was opposing, but he was quite powerful to do that. Even places like Egypt, the, the Mindimir Shaimev got the reception of one independent, the leader of an independent nation. It was the protocol. That's the way the Islamic world treated uh, the, uh, the Shaimev. Then definitely from the 1990s, Putin came to power. Then Putin's terms not well with Shaimev. Putin wanted to control the, the, the regional satrap. So somehow he was successful, but there was big resistance from the Tatars, Tatarstan and from the Bashkuristan. I'm not dealing with Bashkuristan here. But somehow the Shaimo was replaced. Now the Rustam Manik Khano is the, the new president of like the Tatarstan. He is considered as close to Putin. But he's not like the earlier days under Ilsin. Now it's changed. Now the Moscow has more power in Kazan. Then this is Tatar's flag. They stay, the, the snow leopard, the wind snow leopard, the symbol of the Tatar sun, state symbol of Tatar sun. Now I go to the next one, the Shaka Republic. Here, the Shaka Republic is here. It's in the Russian Far East. It's considered as the one, it is the biggest uh, national unit under Soviet Union. It's also considered as the biggest territory of any indi modern independent nation. Even in case of US, the Alaska is quite big. But compared to Shaka, I don't think, but the Shaka is as bigger as as big as India by their geographic territory. But the population is pretty less. Population is mostly <laughs> in the southern side. Here is the most the population because the northern part comes under the Arctic Circle. There's a, even the population is pretty less, maximum 10, 9 million, 9 to 10 million. It's like uh, Chakas are majority, they are uh, around 50 percent, 50, 50 to 55 percent. This again, the Shakas are one of the, the thick group, like uh, the 
Turkic group. They are originally from Central Asia. They migrated to this part of the world between the 12th and 15th century. Before their coming, there is the so-called Siberian people. They are here, the, the reindeer herders. They're mostly, there are three groups, mainly the Yuenki, Yukal, Gir, and Yuen. But they are mostly in the northern side, in this Arctic belt. But majority of population lies here with the Tatars and the ethnic Russians, especially around here, the Yakutsk and so many industrial places. What's the pe peculiarity of Yakutia is that even though it's like a considered quite icy, inhospitable, inhospitable in name, but it has lots of natural resources, especially diamond. And almost 100% of Russian diamond from the Yakutia. Then Yakus again has 25% of world diamond trade. It's basically based on Yakutia, Shakhtar Kokhim. Because almost all the di big diamond companies have this investment here including the South Africa giant, the Deboy, have mines in Kapoor. Then the Yaku Soviet Social Republic established in 1922. Just like the Tatarstan, Yakutia was the Soviet name. Now it's known as Shakar Republic. It's also declared as Soviet Soviet in 1990. Then again, like Nindima Shaimai, there was other strong man in the Shakar Republic. His name is like Mikhail Nikolayev. Like the Shaimei, he was also pretty close to Helsin. Pretty close to Helsin, but what Shaimei did, he also did the same thing because Moscow feared the further disintegration after the disintegration of the Union Republic. So they were somehow compromising with the, the, the regional satraps. During the Soviet Union, most of the natural, almost all natural resources went through the Moscow because the uh, the Shakka Republic hardly get any sort of the benefit of the, 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 you know, the resources they have. Due to the centralized economy, a uh, big chunk of resources went to Moscow. But under Shaim, that's why the Shakka Republic is one of the backward uh, province of the USSR, even though it has lost so many natural resources. But Nikolai changed this, you know, the, the, this situation. But uh, during the Elsin's insecurity, he somehow managed to control uh, some hold over the, the resources of Shakhtar. Still, the, the Shakhtar Republic has hold over, not like not like during the Soviet Union time. But again, the Putin space changed the equation. It's no more the de decentralized. It's become more centralized. Now the Vachislav Tiro. Now that there is other one from the 2010. Vachislav Tiro is also considered close to Putin, not like the Nikolai. Because Nikolai is part of the old guards, the ex-communist group. So the, again, the Putin appoint the regional governors. That's why the almost all republics are forced to replace the sovereignty from the constitution because everyone has like Tatarstan also has sovereignty, Shakhtar Republic also has sovereignty. The Tuva also has the term sovereignty in their constitution. That means the provincial constitution, because Putin asked Putin and the, the constitution court. Ask all republics to don't do that because it's like uh, it doesn't work because Russia has its own federal constitution because all provinces have their own independent constitution. Mean it openly challenged Moscow. So uh, Sharkas removed the term constitution from 2000, uh, their uh, constitution. Our Tatars also did something, but it's like this paradox kind, you know, like uh, but Putin somehow okay, but then. This again the Shakhtar Republic flag, which they adopted it uh, after the disintegration of Soviet Just wait it out, do back. Test. This is a test of the University of Kansas Emergency Public Address System. This is only a test. In the event of an actual emergency, instructions will be given using the system. This is only a test. Test, test. This is a test of the University of Kansas. <laughs> Say the word Putin many times. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, I think we're I think we're good. I did this stuff. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, then this is the Republic flag that they adopted in 1990, the time they declared their sovereignty. Again, the Tatar symbol. Just look at the diamond here. It's considered as their property. Like diamond has any big symbolic uh, value in the, the, the Shaka Republic. That's why you see the diamond, the diamond, the Shaka diamond. Then I goes to the last one, the, the Tuva. It's, it's close to Mongolia, the, 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 here, but it's close to Mongolia and China. Tuvas, again, I, I did made this uh, the first statement at the beginning of my presentation. That again, the history of Tuva is different. Tuva is quite different from other Soviet uh, territories. First of all, Tuva was under China for a long time. It was close to the, the, the Chinese Mongolia. Then even the Tuvans were loyal to the Chinese Empire in the Beijing. Then Russians appeared in only in the 19th century as gold mine workers because we should understand that Tuva was never ever part of Russian Tsar. Then they again they enjoyed independence during 1921 to 1944. Even the, the Soviets respected the Tuva's independent status. But in 1944, during the Second World War, the Stalin uh, forced Tuva to join with Soviet Union. Because during the Second World War, the no one cared what happened there. Then in 40, 1944, so it enjoyed long freedom, it was not associated to the new Russian sort of stuff for quite a long time, not like the Tatar Tsar of the Shaka Republic. It was under Soviet Union, it was even under Russian Tsar for quite a long time. Then again, like uh, during the uh, nine, late 1980s, uh, the time of the Glasnost and Pestroika, the, the popular front, there is one group, nationalist group, uh, came forward in the Tuva for the Tuva's independence under the very nationalist leader, the Kadrul Bikkelday. Because the Tuvas was in Moscow, the Tuva was considered just like Chechnya. It's the most troublesome place. After Chechnya, these people ha are considered very troublesome. Even the Tuvans had fight with Russians in the, the I think, 1990s. Because uh, even the Russian population was lesser in Tuva compared to other parts of uh, Soviet Union. Just like in Tatarstan, the Russians were almost 50 percent. Yakutia, the Russians were majority. Even place like this Kazakhstan, the Russians were the majority. Slavs were the majority. But in Tuva, the Tuvans were majority. The Russians were minority. Besides, the Tuvans enjoyed the freedom for a long time. So the Tuvans know that they are not. They were. They they had their own independence. So the Bikel Day was problem maker in the beginning. Again, they openly rejected the federal constitution. Even the Boris Yeltsin. Uh, felt defeat, you know, he, he got defeated in Tuva. The Tuvans were not ready to accept both the things. In the referendum, Elsin got only the 15 percentage of vote in Tuva. Tuva is, I think in Chechnya, Elsin faced the same thing, but Tuva was different. Then, but later phase, what happened that there was power struggle in Tuva between this Bekele and then Sheribul Osa. He was the first Tuvan president, like post, so we post QSSR Tuvan president. There was power struggle between Sheribul Osa and the Bekele. In the 1990s, later after that, the United Russia Party and the Russian Party of Life, com life the, the further competition. So, during those periods, like in the early uh, 21st century, uh, towards themselves called Putin to interfere to fi finalize their issues because there were lots of power struggle between them, especially Bikaldai and Korsak. So, the Putin appointed his own person, Sholgan Khairan. Sholban Karaul. The Sholban Karaul is considered pretty, no, even though he's a Tuvan, uh, he spent most of his time in like in Moscow. He was acclaimed wrestler. So he's also close to the Putin. So the Tuvans are no more discussing about the, the like the political sovereignty. They are they are more looking to some other aspects. Now I go to the, this again the Tuvan Tuvans also have their own flag, their own national symbol. Then I come to the conclusion, here I think you might observe that almost all these three republics have some sorts of similarities. Similarities, there are differences, but they all follow the same route. 
to the, the Pasan state. They were all quite active. The nationalist movements were quite active during uh, the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Just like other Union republics, these autonomous republics also demanded independence. But later, they all declared the sovereignty in 1990s. 1990, they all adopted their own constitution. They all exploited the Moscow's weakness during those days because there was uncertainty. But Putin first, like, forced them to compromise on their political ambitions because uh, the places like the uh, Shaka Republic and Tuva, they removed the constitution from, removed the term sovereignty from their constitution forever. Tatars also compromised because they all look for the economic sovereignty. They, they all want more control over the natural resources than, not like Soviet Union. Soviet Union time, they don't have a voice because Moscow decided they're here. But now it changed. Now they need, they're not looking for political independence right now. We can't say what, what will happen in the future. But they're all uh, demanding the economic thing, economic factor, because they are concentrating on economic sovereignty. Somehow it works. That, that's what I see. It's not, not like Soviet US of time. This has looked the early 1990s photo of why then the Mintyamur Shemai was on top. He was with President Yeltsin here. Uh, he is here with uh, the... the mm, I don't know exactly. Moscow, Moscow mayor, I think. No, that was the foreign... Primakov. Uh, Primakov. Yeah. Uh, Primakov. 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 He is with President Clinton. Again with the German Chancellor. Oh, uh, sure. Then he is suspecting his like uh, Islamic identity with the Islamic minority and his native village, with all his relation uh, counterparts, then Turkish person, then again uh, with Isin because the uh, with the, the Orthodox priest in like in, in the Kassan, because he. Uh, respected this uh, religious diversity of Tatarstan because there were Jews, the Christians, then he thought it's necessary for the survival of Tatarstan. Then he's again here with the, the, the Tatar model, they're promoting the fur products. If from this we can understand, even though they are Muslim, they are, what can I say, quite Europeanized at least with the way of dressing, they are different from the East, typical Eastern, anyway. Thanks for your patience.